Good evening, everybody. Hi, this is Terry, your ARBA District 8 Director. Welcome this evening to another virtual youth workshop. Uh, my apologies for being just a little late this evening, but we were dealing with some internet issues and luckily everything got fixed uh, just in time. Uh, this evening, we're joined by a renowned KV judge and somebody that uh, and I worked with years ago on our Judges Continuing Education Committee. She really, really was impressive then, and uh, I asked her to join us this evening, and she uh, thankfully agreed to. Uh, that is Judge Rosalie Beard of Utah, and tonight Rosalie is going to be speaking on Texels Breeding and Exhibition. And I just want to remind everybody before we go over to Rosalie to please chime in with where you're located at. Uh, we're always, you know, happy to see where our viewers are at. And also any questions you might have, please uh, type those in. And at the conclusion, Amanda at our control center will read those off to Rosalie and I'm sure you'll get a good answer too. So with that, Rosalie, take it away, please. There, all right, can you hear me now? <laughs> Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. I want to thank both Terry and Amanda for being able to do this, for the technical difficulties that they've gone through for it, and for all the work they put into this. And welcome to the wonderful world of Texels. We're going to start with our first slides. Amanda, can you put those on? Yes, I am. Oh, right thank here. you, because <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> You'll have to look at my face if you can't put them on. <laughs> mm. So that's our introduction. We'll go to the next slide. The standard of perfection, what a beautiful cover we have on our new standard. I hope that you will get this. Uh, it is so good for you, whether you're breeding them or you're breeding any breed, or you're thinking of becoming a judge, you need this book. Okay, the next slide. The Texel is one of the six long-haired breeds that uh, has the same amount of classifications that uh, it has six. And this is the long-haired breed, and there are six of those long-haired breeds, and they have six classifications that we'll be going through later. Unique to a Texel is the ringlets, and we're going to talk about those later. The sweeps are to be balanced and to create a uniquely rounded shape. You won't see that in many of the other standards, and there's no rosettes or ridges. Okay, next slide. Cobby body. That's unique also to the Texel into the description. Short and compact is what a cobby body means. Be sure to look in your glossary, your KV glossary to see what uh, some of these terms mean so you can understand them. And all of the other things that describe that are pretty much in the other standards of the other breeds. Here is another uniqueness that is the head. It is short with a well-filled muzzle and a smooth curve to the crown. Rounded appearance, there again we have a rounded appearance in balance, in balance with the body. And then the other features are similar to the other breeds. Uh, that short head is, um, is also in some of the other breeds, but they're with a little different uh, techno technology put in the words. So you'll want to, to look at your breed and see how it uh, compares with the other breeds. The, the Americans have, and most of the long-haired breeds, except for the Cornet, have a long, or not a long, but have a Roman nose, which is a short, broad head. And you can also see what Roman nose means in your glossary. And then other features are similar to other breeds. Okay, the next slide. This, this breed has springy, clearly defined ringlets that can be either corkscrew or curls. The coat texture is, is identified as soft and dense. However, texture can be anything from really fine to almost a coarse texture, but it needs to be soft and dense and springy. The hair on the head is a little bit like the Teddy in that it has a kink 
around the nose and then it gradually uh, increases in length to blend with the hair on the crown. It may be parting over the shoulders as the curls are heavy and develop and weigh down the coat, but it should not part over the rump. Okay, next slide. So the rear coat is full and in balance with the sides. Those are called the sweeps and they're called that on, they don't really designate them as sweeps on a texel, but they are on all the long hairs there. All their coats should be balanced with the side and the rear. Unique to the texel is belly hair that is dense and curly. And it must be free of mats or felting. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too. Now on the other side there, you'll see the curl uh, comparison. Each of those lines is one inch. The first one is a one eighth of an inch. That's the smallest curl or ringlet. And the second one is three fourths of an inch. That's quite a bit larger. That's the largest curl or ringlet. And the third one with the star on it is a three eighths of an inch, which is ideal. And I measured that on my little pinky finger and it's about the width of my pinky, pinky fingernail. Just to have an idea if I ever really wanted to, to look and see what the ideal was and then compare the other ones. But that is what the curls need to be or should be within that range. Okay. Roman nose. All right, we've talked about that. In all the other breeds, it's a fault. I mean, it's, I, in all the other breeds, it's accepted, but it's a fault in a Texel. So what is a Roman nose? Well, a Roman nose in your, uh, in your, your standard of perfection will tell you that that is a, I can find it here. It, actually, it's, it's a broad, wide nose that has a curvature from the nose to the crown, and it should not be golf ball. Now the teddies and the uh, teddy satin and the texel all have a little bit description, different description. They don't talk about a Roman nose. In fact, it's a fault in a, in a texel. It's not in a teddy, but it is something that is described as more of a rounded nose, but not golf ball. So there is a little different. And if you look at the pictures in your standard, in the new standard, you can look at the heads on those animals and determine what is the difference between that Roman nose and that Texel nose or that Teddy nose or the Abbey nose, which is not Roman at all. It's, it's a medium length to offset the, the animal, but it shouldn't be a real straight flat nose either. So those are things to compare, especially if you're gonna become a judge, you wanna compare different standards and how they are described. So lacking density and unevenness of the density is something that is a fault and we will, I will show you that as, as I bring you a sample, a specimen of a Texel and we'll look at that. And a straight coat lacking the ringlets and you'll see some of those in some pictures that we're going to have. Uh, that is where the ringlets develop is underneath the coat. And a lot of times a judge will lift up the coat and they'll say, oh, there's the ringlets, but you want to see that on the top coat too. And I'll show you how to tell for that. And then fuzziness, matting, felting, when the hair becomes interwoven like a mat is definitely a fault. If you cut that fuzziness out, that hair out and you leave a blunt cut or a shortened rear sweep that it's not in balance, that will be disqualified. It will no longer be a fault. Okay, next slide. These are going to be the disqualifications. You can see that there's a lot of things that make sense in this animal. You don't want to see any, any reversal of hair, ridges, crests, rosettes, any of that or even part of it, even on the feet. And I have seen animals with reversal on the feet, not in Texel, but I've seen them in silkies and in silkies in particular. So you do look at that because you can have a little rosette there. Uh, another real definite qualification is the absence of belly curl. Sometimes those bellies are dragged along in their uh, cages and they lose the hair on them and they don't have any curl when you put them on the table. So we'll talk more about how to bed them and take care of that. Uh, satin sheen, of course. Extra nipples can be a real problem on some breeds, some um, uh, lines of texels. And if you are able to learn how to, to look at your animal, because they've got a lot of curl there usually, or a lot of hair, uh, you need to look at that and find that nipple line and make sure that you don't have extra nipples. Wet coats. In the standard of perfection, it talks about wet coats. Uh, in Let's see, I'm going to I'm going to pull this page out and just read it to you because you don't find all of this information under each breed. You'll find it throughout the text or the, or the standard of perfection. 
in the KV section on page 270, altering your appearance, indiscriminate use of grouping, grooming preparations, including water designed to alter the natural condition or appearance, but not to include accidental stains or debris from urine, food, or bedding. And then a page before that says, under general disqualifications, under all disqualifying causes, the specimen shall have the benefit of the doubt. Now this grooming practice of, of wetting guinea pigs, the texels in particular down, is a one that, that sometimes releases those curls a little bit and makes them a little more defined. And they will curl up a little better when they're wet. And you can tell if that animal has a lot of water in its coat, all throughout its coat, that is a disqualification. They should be dry when they're put on the table. Okay, next slide. Okay, we talked about six classifications of the Texels and all of the other uh, five other long-haired breeds have these classifications. They're under the same groupings as all of the animals, uh, all of the uh, cavies. The cavings have the groupings of self, agouti, solid, marked, and tan pattern. Isn't that wonderful? We've got the tan pattern now. So we have those groupings, but under those groupings, they have done classifications mainly because they want to have competition in these, these different classifications. Sometimes you don't see these even on the show table and if they're not counted, then they might not, they might have to be regrouped or, or changed later on. But in the Texels, we have the self, the agouti, the broken color, tortoise shell and white, any other variety and the tan pattern. Okay, let's look at the next slide. Here are some examples of two Texels. One is might be a little younger than the other one, but I want you to look at closely at the heads on each one. Can you see the roundness that you need to have on the head and not the flatness? And I want you to look at the crown over the crown and back, whether it's got a part, which is okay, but is there curl or is there some missing broken hairs? Uh, do you see the curl coming clear up to the front of the animal on either one? You can really pick out which one you would choose as the ideal looking Texel. This particular Texel was one I bred and Lee Penrod, who is a guru of Texel breeders and he no longer has them and neither do I, but I still love them and I promote them. But he uh, took this beautiful animal on your right with all the curl and showed that animal in several shows and did really well with it. It didn't frizz up over the back. It had a good sturdy coat on it and it won best in shows in every show he put it in. I know he had three of them in one particular show and I'm not sure how many others, but that was that's kind of the ideal I'm using today for you to use as a standard. Okay, let's look at the next slide and see if we can see some of these other differences in, te in Texels. Here are two uh, different ones. This one on the left the, with the lilac in it and the, the red or the orange, orange in that with the lilac shows a lot of curl and it's just not uh, there yet, but it has some promise. And then the one on the other side, the red and white, uh, you can see that it is still developing that curl too and it has a lot of promise. So both of those have a lot of promise in them. Let's see the next slide and we'll uh, compare a couple more. Okay, this is the same picture of, of this animal and it won pretty well, but this last show it was in, uh, it was starting to get fuzzy over the back. And that particular show had three judges handling it. And uh, it was a very dry air. Uh, it was staticky and it really did a number on that coat. And I never got that back again on the coat. So it's show career was over, but you can see the beautiful uh, corkscrew curls and you can see the nice round head. And those are things you're looking for. Okay, next slide. Okay, this animal uh, is the same size too. Again, it's starting to frizz on the top. This is a little smaller ringlet, but it still is a very nice animal. And uh, you can see that there's a little bit of fuzziness going over on this one too. Let's look at the next one and compare that. Here are two youngsters that are still growing their coats out, but one on the black, the torsional white with the black on it, is showing a lot of curl already. The other one is just starting to form and it's going to be a different type of, of a ringlet. It's going to be more of a corkscrew and you can see the difference, but they still have a lot of hair over the shoulders and the crown. And that's what you want is density there. And that as the development comes around, it should start developing there too. Uh, if they have that kind of density and, and they don't have just flat 
and lack of hair. Okay, next slide. This one is one of the same animal that has been sprayed with water. A lot of people will do this when they're advertising their animals for sale. They'll spray them with water and they'll get it all curled up and they want people to see the curl. Those animals did not, this, uh, this animal, I should say, this animal did not develop very good curl through the crown and the sides. And I wanted to see what it would do. And you can see how it's just not curling and it should be curling better than that. Okay, let's look at the next slide. So water on an animal, you don't really know what you've got. Here's another animal that had the same thing done to it, but it's curling up, starting to curl better. Uh, this one turned out a little bit nicer, but you can see the rounded shape of the of the uh, sweeps, the rear and tight sweeps all blend well in a round shape. The head is a rounded shape. It's just a nice picture of the animal, but there's still some things going on with the curl that need to be uh, 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 developed. Okay, let's look at the next one. This is a nice youngster that really did well. And, and it's not very old. I think it was like maybe four months. And you could see that that it has everything it needs to, to be on the show table. Even that little curl hanging near the eye, it's all of that is starting to curl really well. And that animal was very nice. Okay, let's look at the next one. Okay, here's two more animals. In the one on the left on the blue, you can see that it had a little bit of water in its coat. Can you see the stringiness? And that curled up later on and it looked really nice. The one on the right on the show board has smaller diameter corkscrew curls, but a very nice animal. It's going a little fuzzy over the back. Okay, let's look at the next one. All right, on the, the side with the dark background is a beautiful Texel that Lee Penrod gave to me and he produced some very nice babies but on the uh right or i mean on the, on the blue is a i don't remember if that's one of his babies or not but i was trying to improve that color do you see the change the difference in the color of course the background enhances it a little bit on the with the blue against the red but it definitely was a better colored animal and so we we helped each other out we did a lot of trading and and helped each other improve our animals okay let's look at the next slide and that's one thing, if you can get someone to work with you on them, it's wonderful. This is a little cream. I thought I'd do these. I thought, what a fun thing to do is to get into creams. Um, they still have a lot of work to go on the ones that I was breeding. You can see on the left side that there's a line going down the back and it's going all the way down, almost to the rump. You can't see that on the right side, but um, that animal never did develop a very good coat. Let's look at the next slide. But it was a start, so don't throw your starts away. Okay, again, you can see the animal on the uh, the blue, the, the uh, greenish color with the carrot uh, has a really nice coat. That's what you're looking for. The animal on the blue is just a baby, so I can't really compare it to the other. It hasn't had a chance to develop, but there was a line starting to go, and you can see the light catching on it. It went down from the crown and all the way down the back, and that's what I called for. I did not keep that animal even to watch it develop because I found out that those lines that go all the way down the back they go flat and they cause the hair to part and they're, they lack the density that you need and, and the curl. Okay, next slide. Okay, here's the baby that I'm holding upside down to show you that there's no belly curl. Oh dear. But I want to tell you that I had a lot of babies born like this and they developed it. I had other babies born with curl all over the place and gradually that curl fell out and went straight. So know your lines when you get your animals keep them for a while, keep their, uh, their, the babies in the litters and compare them and watch them and maybe have somebody that's more experienced compare them and see what you think, especially if you get your start from one breeder, you can ask them to critique your litter because they know what their lines do. Some of these animals don't show their curl until they're a little older. And by then the pet store time is over with and they're too big to put in the pet store. So uh, you need to know what your lines are doing. On the other side was a really nice Texel that, that uh, won a best in show in that show. And you can see the curl even from, even though it's, it's not a real clear picture, you can see a lot of curl on that animal. Okay, let's do the next slide. These little pink eyed whites are quite an enigma. They um, come out of red and whites. And if you breed them, that's what they produce are red and whites. However, I bred one to a, a dilute and I did get dilutes. So I'm wondering about that. But they are really cute and they're lovely. They look like little lambs. And Lee and I uh, talked about these 
And he got one that he thought was good enough to put on the show table, but never as good as his regulars. And I never had one that really curled like I wanted to. So uh, I used them for breeding because they did produce some pretty nice babies. On the other side, you see a stringy looking Texel that just is not developing the curl like it should. And that's what you see a lot of times. They lack density, they lack the genetics for that curl. Okay, next slide. Here are two youngsters that are promising. You can see that they're not real curly yet, but they're just babies. And they have a lot of good density over the shoulders and the crown. I really look for that because that's where they lack. Another thing that they can lack in is in the rear. Sometimes they go flat and the coat isn't as curly over the rear. So those are two places to look on your babies as they develop is that rear sweep in the center of it and also over the shoulders and crowns. You also wanna see that develop around their cheeks. You'd like that flowing clear in the front of the, the ear so that it's flowing nicely. Okay, let's look at the next one. Okay, these are showing some different curls. Um, I can't remember if they're the same animal in, or not. They almost look like it, but I don't think they are. Uh, this The one on the left is not curling quite as well. It's kind of a loose curl, but it has a lot of hair over the crown, which which makes me think that with a little bit of, of moisture in that coat, you don't want, you want some humidity. You don't want a lot, but you need to have some humidity and a little bit of moisture in that coat might help that curl up better. The other one you can see how well it already has curled. Nice big ringlets that go clear throughout the back. Getting a little fuzzy over the back of it, but it's it's pretty nice and you can see the nice rounded head. Okay, let's go to the next one. Another one, these are two different animals. You can see the size of the corkscrew. Uh, they're both corkscrew and uh, a little bit of curl on that one on the right. And they both did pretty well on the show table. So you get different sizes of the curls. And I like all the sizes. So I, I don't worry too much if it's got really big fat ones or if it's got little skinny ones. <laughs> but the ideal of course is in the middle there. It's about three eighths of an inch in diameter. Okay, let's look at the next one. This is a young boar named Mr. Pepper that I was tickled to find on the internet for sale. He belonged to a Jennifer Rourke, and I believe that she is in Montana, or no, she's in uh, Wyoming. And uh, I saw him on her page, Facebook page, advertising him for sale. And I told her I would really like to get him, but I couldn't get him for a whole month because there was a show coming up that we were going to, she was going to send him to in Colorado. So um, she told me that he had been in with a friend that had chewed him royally, and he was very short looking. And I said, well, is there any way that you can maybe put, put him by himself so that I could get some pictures of him as he curls up. That's what she did. And this is what she got for me. And you can see how beautifully, even though he was sheared down, how beautifully that curl came back and bounced back. He uh, wasn't ever really put in a, on a situation uh, on a pad or anything like that where his coat was protected, but he did really well. And he produced some really nice dilute babies for me. He is what they call a dilute agouti. He has the pink eyes. He has a lilac base and a, a red, uh, an orange tip which is called a salmon agouti, but that's not accepted as a term that we use. But in the old days, we used to use all sorts of terms like that, salmon agouti and Boston creams. And oh, there's a whole list of them. I'd like to put them on some day and let you look at them. Okay, let's look at the next slide. So this, this shows the matting system I use in my cages. And I, I take these rabbit resting mats and I've tried so many other things. I've tried the fleece pads under them, I've tried all different kinds of bedding, just plain fleece. And my washing machine hates washing that. Um, so I came up with this and I think other people might use it by now. Um, at a show, I was able to pick some of these show boards up and then later on I ordered some or show boards. They're a plastic resting mats, rabbit resting mats. I had the uh, gentleman cut one in half for me. Later on, I just broke them in half by bending them. And I those fit nicely in my two whole carriers that I got from um, one of the oh, KW cages, those, those little squares, they fit nicely. And I think they fit in the three holes too. But anyway, they are wonderful to take. And I will sometimes put a, a piece of fleece when they're traveling on top of those so that they can rest their feet a little bit more because they can't move around there. And they can also uh, have the moisture wicked away from them a little better. But you can uh, zip tie these in different sizes you can put them together. You can put the small ones with the big ones or the big ones together. You can make what size you want. And I then I turn the little knot on the zip tie underneath so they don't get caught on that. Then I throw in a, <clears throat> an empty toilet paper tube or a uh, 
empty paper towel roll that I've cut up and some nice hay cubes and they seem to be pretty happy. But that doesn't mean you don't clean their cages. You still have to check them every day for wet spots and for the breakdown of the wood pellets that I use under them. I do like those stove wood pellets under them. I've tried other bedding and that's just my preference. And there's other ways to do this. Not just this, but this is just an idea. Okay, let's look at the next one. Okay, the, on the, <clears throat> the picture with me on there, that's um, some of the first texels that were coming out. <clears throat> There's a whole, nother, a whole story about these texels and their development, and I, I would like to do that some other time because they used to look like they had no hair on the sides in the front and it was all a hula skirt in the back. But now these texels are not too bad. You can see that that line on that, uh, I believe it's a tortoise shell white or golden beauty, red and white. Uh, it looks like the line carries almost down to the back. And that's okay as long as it doesn't go through the rear and make that part. Then the cream on the other side was, um, has a pretty nice curl in it. It's getting frizzy already and the handling has got to be careful because the texels that we like to see now are a little more fragile on their coats. They don't stand up as well. On the other side is a nice texel that in 2019, the last shows I went to, got three best in shows at a rabbit cavey show with some really good competition. And I was really proud of that cavey. All right, let's look at the next one. <clears throat> George Long is on this, uh, the, the left with me, and that's one of the first texels that I showed. You can see again that dividing line that kind of goes down. It's almost too long. Uh, that need, needed to be improved and not have that, long, that line over the, the back. Over the shoulders and crown is okay, but it's going into the back, and that's not too good. Uh, but it did have some nice curl in it, and the curl came all the way toward the face, which a lot of those were hard to get any curl at all coming out of that shoulder and crown area. And then on the other side is another Texel, but one best in showing some really good competition. That was a nice Texel. Okay, let's look at the next one. Okay, here's another one with Robert Spitzer. It's a little fuzzy, but you can see that that Texel is pretty nice and it had to be under Robert. <laughs> there are some pretty nice animals there, but there were in all the other ones too. So that was kind of a neat thing to, to, to be able to get that best in show. And this other side is a little closer um, picture of the, uh, the, the black and white one you saw at the very first. Uh, I put all these texels on a show table. And at one show, I had a, a, a black self. And at this show, I had a tortoise shell. I had a black and white, a, a tortoise shell and white, and two red and whites. And then you're going to see one on another slide of the one on the other side of it little that Linda Lux is judging. And that one is a brindle. And I'd really worked hard on that one. And the brindle got uh, uh, best of breed in that particular show against these other ones. Let's see the next slide. Oh, maybe you won't see the brindle. That's all right. We had changed some slides around, so that's okay. Um, handling is what we're going to talk about next. One thing I'd like you to be aware of uh, in handling is that fragile place. I'm going to bring you a picture here. And you're going to see my cute little Texel. This is Whimsy. She is uh, one of the few Texels I have left. She has her little ear tag in. And when you handle Texels, Teddies and Abbies, you handle them from underneath. You pick them up from underneath, handle them. Now you have to be firm because if you have an animal that's all over the place and it doesn't want you to handle it, then you've got to be firm if you get bit then, or it's, it's vicious, then you can disqualify it for that. And you can disqualify, I think, a whole entry for that. But anyway, we won't go into that because we hope we don't have any like that. So as an exhibitor, you want to be sure that they learn how to sit on their board. And as a show, as a judge, you want to be sure that you handle them and don't have the exhibitors glaring at you across the table that you have messed it up. So when the animal is sitting there, I'm going to have to raise it because that board's not high enough to put it on. Um, when the animal's just sitting there, you can take your hands before you even check for disqualifications. You can gently check the coat out the way it is presented and you can lift the coat up and you can see the curls falling down and you can see the density in the coat. The same with each side. You can put your hands around the animal very gently and you can feel the rear and you can feel all over the coat like that. You don't have to pull this, the curls out. Um, this one has a couple that have been pulled out sadly because that ruins them. And this one's got more, more of the curl than it does the corkscrews. 
but you can see the many things on that animal just from it being presented on that board and you can turn it around and look at it. Then you can lift the animal up. I'm gonna turn it your way as if you were the judge. You can lift that animal up on its hind legs and you can see, uh, you can see the teeth, you can see the throat and any problems that might be down on the belly. You can see this one's really cute already because there's no belly curl. Uh, one of the things that we find in Texels because there's so much hair on them that gets missed is the nipples. They have two nipples and then they have a nipple line that goes up the side and you can feel the little bumps on that as you do that gently and you can tell if there's extra nipples there. And then you can turn it the other way. So this will be facing you, you'd be the judge and you have the, the head, actually I'm having the head face me this time. And you could turn it the other way and sit on its feet and you could check for the sex and anything else you needed to check under there or fail for that. So those are some ways to handle that Texel. Um, lifting the layers, avoiding putting your hand over this crown if you can help it where it's very fragile and looking at the Texel from this side uh, comparing it with another Texel right by it to see who's got the most curl and the best type and all of that. Now on the head of this Texel, you don't want a head that looks like a Roman nose. You want a little shorter. You want it to, to be in there just a little bit shorter so that it comes down and fills out the jowls. You have these jowls all filled out. So that's what you want. And you want this to be sure to curve. So that's what you're looking for. And you can look at some of those pictures in the standard just to determine that. So that's uh, handling. Okay. Um, when you are thinking of getting stock, I had mentioned before, get it from a reliable breeder and have someone else examine it if you would like a second opinion. I have done it before as a judge. I've examined animals for people and the, the seller should not mind you're doing that just to get a second or third opinion. Um, you do all the things that you do for any breed of KV. You've got to have the commitment. The, the uh, husbandry is important, which is uh, cleanliness, feeding, bedding, cage sizing, so, so on. You know, the things that you do to keep your animal in good health. So if you can purchase stock that's pedigreed, but what good are pedigrees if they aren't filled out or if they're falsified or whatever. But I started keeping pedigrees on many of the lines that people did not want to uh, or did not have pedigrees on. I kept those animals, at least asked for the parents and what color they were. And if they had a pure line of Texels behind them, if they knew. And then I started from that and kept my pedigrees. And that allowed me to see which lines were doing the best some of those lines I cut completely out after a while. If you have a sow that chews her babies and you give her a second chance or a third chance with litters and she still does it and you know you're feeding her properly, she's gone. If her babies start chewing her, that's okay because they do that. But <clears throat> they can learn a lot from their, their mother by chewing or from other animals. So chewing is something that I, I uh, weeded out of my lines. I tried to, it may come back, but I, I tried to do that. Um, you're also looking for an animal that has a good temperament. Why would you put that much time into an animal that runs around in its cage, gets its, its curls all matted, sits under the water bottle, and then is nippy or scared or won't sit on a show board even after you've tried gently to handle it? That's a lot of time to put into an animal like that. If that's the only animal you've got, then I can understand that. But eventually you want to go to a stock that is that you can train to sit on a show board that is gentle, that, that uh, when you call your breeder breedings your babies you know that that animals that are going the animals that are going to the pet store are not going to be biters they're not going to be scratchers they're going to be gentle animals and most texels are gentle at least the ones that i've had are very very sweet and gentle so those are some things to look at um removing mats okay there's that's something that you're going to have happen it's just almost impossible to keep from getting mats so i would suggest that you <clears throat> You take your fingers every day and, and check underneath your guinea pig. And if you need to, you might have to wet that down and dry it. I don't use soap, but you can wet it down and dry it because it might get dirty. You want to be sure you, you don't have a dirty animal with dirty hair. And then you um, can pick those. You can take those little mats and you can pull them out with your fingers. Or you can take a little pick, the end of it or the front of it like this. And you can gently work those little mats out. If you get a big mat, the only way you can do with that, if you still want to show the animal, is to trim it. And if the judge finds that trimmed and it's a large mat, it's a disqualification. So it's almost better to leave the mats in because that's only a fault. So you have to be the judge of that. Uh, keep the toenails trimmed. Toenails will catch in the coat. 
So getting these animals ready for show, those are the things you need to remember, is cleanliness, toenails trimmed, gentleness by, learn, by sitting on a show board quietly for a long period of time. Uh, there's, these are some of the really important things. Um, whether your goals include improving your breeding program, making friends, learning or having fun, or becoming a judge, or just enjoying the hobby, the Texel is a unique and challenging breed. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Rosalie. Great presentation. And I loved your, your KVU you was showing us right there. That, <laughs> that, that was sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and being a cat lover, I did see a cat moving around back there too, so a moment ago. <laughs> okay, Amanda, uh, just a reminder, everybody, if you haven't chimed in yet with your location, please do so, and along with any questions you might have. Uh, Amanda, what do we have coming in so far? Well, we have people that are chiming in that said they're coming in from... We've got Michigan, Ontario, Indonesia times two. Um, California, there was Arizona. I saw some Wisconsin's, um, more Michigan's, as far as people chiming in and saying where they're watching from. And I do have some questions that have started coming in. Um, we will start with, and she may, you may have already, Rosalie, you may have already started mentioning these. I'm going to go ahead and just ask the questions. Um, I have computer difficulties right this second. Uh, it says, do you wrap Texels like you do other long-haired breeds? Am I unmuted? Yes, you're unmuted. Okay. Okay. In <clears throat> the United Kingdom and some of the other countries, they do wrap their Texels. They like a, a coat that's long and uh, just kind of wavy. But under the Arba standard, we show the curly coats. And if you uh, wrap them, you're going to have to pull some of that curl out. Now, I did see a, a mother and a daughter wrap a Texel that one uh, in a show I judged in, the, I think it was in Oregon, many years ago. And they took a piece of uh, sheeting in long strips. They had torn the sheeting in long strips. And one of them held it at the bottom of the curl and the other one gently wound the curl around it. And they then they kind of tied it up with a clip or something. If the animal will put up with that, more power to you. <laughs> but a lot of times they won't put up with clips in their coat. They won't put up with things hanging in their coats or giving them weight, even water. That You'll go to a show with a beautiful Texel that you've worked so hard on. You'll take it out and there's one side of it all zipped off. So be aware of what kind of personalities your Texels have. But in the Arba standard, we don't uh, wrap the coats. Okay. Um, and do you brush them? And how do you keep them clean and not getting knotted? Okay, and that's a very good question. It's a real challenge to keep them clean and not knotted. Um, the main thing is to keep them clean. And some animals are dirty, as I mentioned, some will sit under the water bottle and depending on the kind of shavings and, and bedding that you use, it'll get up in the coat and it will cause those mats even worse. So as I mentioned, uh, daily, or if you have to twice a day, depending on your guinea pig, you know, what it, what it does with this coat, you'll get to know it. they're all individuals. You will want to check underneath there in the rear, especially along the rear sides to see if anything is developing. Uh, gently get the debris out of the coat. If it's become dirty and wet, rinse it out with water and let the coat set, let it sit on a towel until it dries. And then you can uh, uh, pick the little tiny ones out and the bigger ones, if you trim them out, you have that chance of it being, being disqualified. If it's just a mat, it's a fault. Um, another thing I wanted to tell you about getting that coat to curl up for a show, and I forgot that, was there are several ways to do that. The one is spritzing the coat with water. Um, I have seen several of the really top breeders do these two different methods. One of them, the night before the show in the showroom, put his Texel on a towel in a bin so that it was, it was kind of encompassed about with walls and it couldn't jump out. And he took his full bottle of water with a sprayer on it and he soaked that animal from the neck down until it was dripping wet. And then he put it after it 
drained a little bit, he put it on another towel and let it dry under supervision. And then he put it back in the carrier, a little damp. And the next day he changed the bedding on the carrier The he had it on fleece and it was nice and dry to be shown and the curls had just come up so nicely and defined. The other one that I kind of preferred <laughs> because it's, it's a little easier, you don't have to do it the day of the show or the day before, is I take a bucket of water and I've seen this done too, and, or a bin of water, warm water, and I change it for each Texel. And I was doing, I think about 10 or 12 of them one time. And so there was a lot of changing, but I had all these little baskets laid out with towels in them. So I put the animal down to its neck and I swished it around to loosen the curls up and get the debris out. And then I would lay it on a towel in its, in its own little bin. And then I would change that towel just shortly after so that all that soaked up water would not be in there. Give it a carrot, let it dry in a warm place for um, maybe an hour. Uh, I did that with each Texel in a fresh batch of warm water, no soap added, nothing like that. Uh, but that's because the animals had been kept clean and they didn't have dirty coats in the rear. If you've got a dirty coat in the rear, you might have to figure that out with a little, a little bit of detergent or something, but I've never had to do that. But anyway, those animals look beautiful and they went to the show two days later and looked beautiful too. And before they were put on the table, uh, well before they were put on the table, I spritzed over the top of them just a little bit to give that moisture in there so they weren't frizzy. Because some of those um, animals have that static electricity in and that frizziness and it's not their fault. So I did do that, but the animal had to be dry when it went on the table and it was. Okay, next question. Anymore? <laughs> Thank you. I just had to unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> See, that um, was short. <laughs> yeah. Is, can you explain what makes a KV and a goody? An agouti pattern has a base and it has a tip color. And on the rabbits and some of the other breeds, they have uh, lines of, of uh, color going through a banding effect. Um, but it has, a, but in the cavies, and I've seen it in cavies too. I've actually seen the banding effect on some of the long hairs. But it has a base color. And if it's a, a golden agouti, the tip color will be the same color as the belly. If it's a silver agouti, the tip color will be the same. It'll be white like the belly. If it's a dilute, the tip color will be the same as the belly. So you just need to know what it is. And if you look in the standard, you will find out what uh, eye colors are allowed. You'll find out... Um, I'm going to just <clears throat> look at, at this agouti and I want to be sure that I do. So in the KV glossary, <clears throat> agouti is defined as a group of varieties which have a distinct ticking color pattern over the entire animal except the belly. The belly hair matches the tip color and should be clean colored and devoid of ticking. And one of the things you want to look for is the tips on the feet. I have seen some beautiful silver and gold agoutis with tips on their feet, the tips of the white or the tips of the, the red on their feet. And if they don't have them, that's a fault. But there, it is possible, and I've seen that. So a goody is a banding color with a separate base color and a separate tip color. Okay. Okay, and I'm trying to see here where I'm at on my list. Do you find what do you find that different color varieties have different textures and different curls? I have seen that in some. <clears throat> um, I think that these uh, some of these newer varieties, like the dilutes and the uh, whites and the uh, and some of those colors, have a little. Seems like they have a little finer coat, and they they just. Um, they, they feel a little different texture. Uh, black, my black texels had a heavier coat, so did my tortoise shells that had the black color in them with the red and the agoutis. They seem to have a little different texture on their coat. I've mentioned that before. So you'll just have to see what yours do, you know, because that's my own experience. And I don't know if that's across the board or not, but I do think there are different textures in different varieties. Is that, did that answer that question? <laughs> Can't remember what it was. Um, let me see here. Yeah, the question yeah. was basically what what um are there do different variety or different varieties do they have different textures and different curls? They can, but in within a variety they can have different textures. Okay. Um I have here some more people that were chiming in saying that they were watching from Michigan, Manitoba, Ohio. California, there's a Kentucky, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. And then I have 
um, a question here of how often do you clean them and how often do you get satins? I never got a satin with my lines. It was completely free of it in all the pedigrees and I never got a satin and I never tried to get a satin. However, a lot of people don't have a choice but to go back to an animal that they wouldn't really if they had the stock available and they might accidentally get a satin out of something that carries it. Um, that's why pedigrees, uh, correct pedigrees are so important to me because I can on mine their lines, oh, I don't know how many generations, 15 or 20 generations back or more. And it was, uh, there was not a satin among them and I never got one and Lee never got one and anybody I sold them to never told me they got one out of them. So um, I think that it just depends on the genetics and what's behind them. And you might inquire if you're buying stock, if they know that there's any satin behind them. I'm not saying not to breed them if that's all you, you have available, but you need to be aware that satin is a disqualification and you cannot show those without them being disqualified if they're definitely satin. But they're sure beautiful and you could certainly keep them as pets and you can sell them to the pet store and you can sell them as pets. So, um, you know, they're gorgeous animals, but I never did get a satin in any of mine. I think I've been breeding them for 25 years or more, quite a long time. Yeah, I don't want to date myself. <laughs> At this time, I don't have any more questions that have come in. Okay. I think the one question, excuse me, well, I think the one question that I may not have answered correctly was uh, keeping them clean underneath the, and how often that you should do that. Uh, it, it depends on the, the animal, how clean it is, because some of them, like I said, will sit under water bottles or they'll run around their cage. They'll drag their little bottoms in the, the bedding. So just be aware of the uh, type of animal that you're, you have, it's, it's a personality and what it does and find the right type of bedding or caging accordingly. If it's gonna run up, rub up against your wire cages and ruin its curl, you don't want that either. I kept all of mine in wire cages and they were fine. But I have heard of that happening. So just be aware of your animals, uh, your, your particular personality on your animal and what it likes to do. And that would tell you how much you need to check the coat and clean it and take care of it. Okay. <laughs> okay, Amanda, anything else right now? It looks, okay, I do hold on a second here. Do you ever cross breeds with Texels to get a specific color you're wanting but can't find? Well, I've never done that, but I know people that have. Um, when, this is probably another presentation, but when the first Texels came into this country, um, they were that hula skirted type and they were quite costly from, from England. And I was able to get a progeny of some of those very first Texels. So we were limited. So some of the people decided to take a Teddy and breed it to a Silky because these Texels came out of the Shelties, which are, uh, which are Silky in England, bred to a Rex. Now the Rex is like our Teddies, but it has a more severe uh, kinky gene in it. There's, that's the only way I know how to describe it because it produces with that, that Sheltie or that Silky, it produces a start of a Texel. It isn't a real good Texel, but it's a start of one and then you can breed it up. And that's what was done to get the Texels. So people here thought, well, we're gonna take a Teddy and we're going to do that. And they never got curled, no matter how much they bred those together and the bred progeny and the progeny, they always had these coats that were just lacking in curl. They had a little bit of kink in them, but that was about it. So um, I have never wanted to use an outcross in another breed. Now, if you can find a Texel of the, of the uh, variety that you wanna work with, um, and it's not that great, because I started with some that were like that. Some of my creams were like that. Some of my blacks were like that. My golden goodies and my uh, tortoise shells. And I started with ones that weren't that great, but I, I kept breeding them. But after a while you get a, a small genetic pool and that's what I was getting. So I decided that they needed to go to someone else that already had those colors and wanted to work with them but it takes a long time for you to bring that curl back in if you aren't careful. So beware of the genetics part of it. Okay, I have some more questions that are popping in. I'm not sure, exactly sure 100% what this is referring to. It was probably a comment when, when you were talking, but they were asking about the Dalmatian Texel 
And this person also asked, said that they have a Californian white foul and the color isn't recognized by the ACBA, why? I think they're still working on those cow pattern. I think they have another year to go or something, if I remember. They aren't accepted just yet, but they're, they've had two, I believe I read that they've had two acceptances and they just need the third, but I'm not sure on that. But I don't think the cow pattern is, is accepted into our standard yet. That's why about that. And it's going to be fairly shortly. As far as um, Dalmatian Texels, I have not yet seen one, but I think they would be, be pretty nice. But again, when you have that Texel uh, curl, it's going to, to uh, distort the look of the Dalmatian pattern, the spots. And there are some things that just won't look as good in some of these longer haired breeds uh, as it does in the short haired breeds. So you'll just have to see where they come up, if you can find one or look at one from another country, they probably have them and you can go online and, and look for that and see if you can find one that's already been developed and you might find something really nice looking. I don't know, I haven't done it. Um, and can you discuss what other types of animals that you would call from your breeding program? Example, the cabies that chew on each other, et cetera. I had a, a line that would never develop the density over the crown and shoulders. It was always straight and short and the hair was brittle and broke, even on the babies. I culled that line out. I had another line that I got from California. I paid a lot of money for it years ago. And the, the parents were beautiful, but every litter, and I got quite a few animals from that lady and paid a lot. And the, the she no longer has Texels. And she, she sold some beautiful ones to Lee and other people and they did fine. But the particular ones I got that looked wonderful, the babies, even one in the uh, the uh, sow and litter contest, they were so pretty and they just grew up and went straight and they had a little bit of curve and no, nothing over the crown of back. So you have to know your lines and what they do with your humidity, with your bedding, with the way you handle animals. Um, I've had other animals like in the long hairs, uh, Peruvians that did well for other people, but I had to have higher humidity in my caviary and that just made their hair matte. Uh, so I gave up all my other long hairs for Texels. <laughs> <laughs> so find out what you can handle in your own caviary. <laughs> and it looks like this question is referring to um, Dalmatians. It said, um, so would I breed a self black, or I'm sorry, a self black tor tor or Texel to an American short haired Dalmatian? Well, if you don't see any Dalmatians in your area that you can't get a hold of any, you can certainly try that. Um, it will be a long process to develop that coat again so that it doesn't just have the length in the rear. It will come around the sides and <clears throat> over the shoulders and crown. And that's already a weakness in a lot of the textiles that I see on the show table. So it might be a long process, but you can try it. I, I'm not saying don't try it. It might be really interesting. I don't have that many years to try anything like that. I think it'd be fun. So go ahead and try it. <laughs> um, it looks like at this time, I have run out of questions. I guess just uh, one from me, uh, Rosalie, uh, <clears throat> say for a newbie in the KB world, would tech cells, would those be more one of the easier breeds or one of the more difficult or somewhere in the middle to get started in? Well, any of the long hairs can be a little more time consuming. It depends on whether you are patient, <laughs> long suffering, <laughs> and you're willing to do what, what it takes. Um, in my estimation, if you're starting with a child to show, unless the adult can give them a lot of, of advice and help them, probably one of the short haired breeds would be the best to work with at that point. The Texels are certainly easier for me to work with than when I had to coat one out and wrap it every day because I didn't have to do that with the Texel and that is the plus side of, of the Texels is that you don't have to wrap them, but you have to keep them clean. Mm. <laughs> Just like in the rabbits, I know so many of the things, if you keep your rabbit clean, you don't have to worry about what do I do to remove the stain or how do I do all that stuff. So yeah, yeah. I get what you're saying. <laughs> uh, well, for all of our viewers out there, um, let me move on to something else real quick, but we'll come back. And in the meantime, feel free if you haven't chimed in yet with any questions 
or comments or where you're located at, please do so and we'll be right back with you. Uh, for those of the, you that may not have caught the whole uh, video tonight, or uh, if you wanna to refer to somebody else, uh, we will be putting this on our YouTube channel for District 8. Give Amanda at our control center a few days and she'll have it up. The District 8 YouTube channel is called ARBA D8 website. Again, ARBA D8 website. Uh, all of our virtual events are located there, along with several of our live events that we did as well. It's uh, free, no registration. Uh, feel free to check it out when you have time. Uh, the other thing I'd like to do is uh, introduce a, another one of our workshops coming up. Uh, this one, we're going back to the rabbit side of things. Uh, looking out to February the 25th at 7.30 p.m., we're just a little bit later in the start time, uh, February 25th at uh, 7.30. As you know, uh, we have a new standard of perfection that recently uh, come into effect. And, uh, you know, every year, there's every time we do this, there's some type of changes. And that's always, you know, what changed in this breed? What changed in that breed? Well, we went to the source, right, to a former member of the uh, Rabbit Standards Committee, and that is Judge Roger Hassenflug from Oregon. Uh, he was on the ARBA Standards Committee for the Rabbits uh, when the new standard was uh, created. So Roger's going to do a presentation called Changes in the Standard of Perfection for 2021 through 2025, and this will apply to the rabbit side of things. So uh, we'll be uh, showing a flyer for that very, very soon here, but uh, that'll be out here as our next uh, virtual workshop, and everyone is invited to tune in and check that out. I think that'll be some very interesting material. Uh, I know Roger did that for a 4-H club that I'm aware of, and uh, did a great job. So uh, we ask him to join it, join us here on D8 and do the same for us. And thank you, Roger, for uh, taking me up on my offer. Uh, much appreciated. Now, going back to, uh, to uh, Rosalie, Amanda, do we have any more chime-ins, locations, questions, any good stuff like that? No, we, we just have somebody that says they were watching in from Bakersfield, um, California. Um, and Roger was the one for, um, back to the Roger thing. Um, he actually did it for our 4-H club. And if you happen to have a standard when that um, presentation is going on, um, that might be helpful to have it with you. Um, I tried to highlight changes while, the, while he was doing the um, presentation for the changes and there's way too many. <laughs> so, um, but if you have your standard that kind of helps follow along with that presentation. Okay, so Amanda, do we have anybody else uh, chiming in with locations or questions? At this point, no. <laughs> okay, Rosalie, hey, I really want to thank you for uh, joining us. I mean, it was a pleasure uh, those years ago we worked together and uh, I thank you now for joining us and talking about this really pretty breed. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, that was my pleasure. <laughs> oh, I think I, I've got to ask the KV that's over your left shoulder there. That is so cute looking out. You want to, do you want to show a picture of it? <laughs> yeah, that's all oh, that is. That is adorable. Yeah, it's one of my little buddies. <laughs> uh, oh, that is adorable. <laughs> That is cute. Uh, so Amanda, anything else coming in before we start to sign off? Oh, um, I put some other ones in here. We're having some thank yous that are trying to start even chime in. Um, but other than that, I do not have anything else. Okay. Well, again, Rosalie, um, most appreciated. And thanks for um, giving us your time this evening. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I also want to say a thank you to my awesome D8 web team. We have Amanda Behe at the Control Center. Uh, looks like she's at NASA. She's got like three computer screens and a phone opened up. So uh, she does all of our, you might say, the Control Center work for us. Uh, plus, she's also uh, 
is in charge of our D8 Facebook page. Then we have Jane Birch. She's located up in Michigan. She is both our newsletter editor as well as our webmaster. Plus, she does uh, most of our promotional flyers for these events. So, uh, Amanda and Jane, uh, really, really appreciate all of your efforts. Uh, you really helped help me a lot on this. And also, I want to say thank you to everybody out there uh, joining us this evening. Y'all are the reason we do this. So, um, I think that covers everything. Uh, just remember February 25th, Roger Hassenflug, and we'll talk about that new standard. And again, uh, Rosalie, just a super, super job. Amanda and Jane and everybody, much appreciated. So with that, I think we'll need to sign out now, but check in with us in just a little over a week, and hopefully we'll have something else to announce in too. Bye-bye. <laughs>